In today's lecture, we're going to look at an introduction to the idea of minimum mean squared error filtering. It's a very powerful idea and a very general concept. We're only going to scratch the surface here today because it's so rich in applications. The idea is that a minimum mean squared error filter uses the signals that are available to come up with an optimal set of filter coefficients. And those filter coefficients are the ones that minimize the mean squared error. We can think of this, if you're used to filtering with FIR and IR filters, that the minimum mean squared error filter is usually set up as an FIR filter, but this can easily be generalized to other cases where the quote filter is a weighted sum of input signals. These types of filters are usually not frequency selective. In other words, they're typically not a bandpass or low pass filter, but they optimize their frequency response and can adapt to changes in the input signals. So here's the generic way that this problem is set up. We have an, two signals that are critical to the application of this filter. One D of N, which will be in this upper branch here. And then we have another signal X of N. And the idea is to choose filter coefficients W, and the underscore just means that I'm collecting those in a vector. So this underscore denotes vector. The filter coefficients themselves are W sub K. And our goal is to find the filter that will take X of N as an input and try to approximate D of N. So we're going to call that approximation that comes out of the filter D hat of N. It's just an FIR filter applied to the input. And our error then is the difference between our actual D of N and our estimate of D of N. And this is as I said, a very powerful framework that can be applied to a lot of different problems. We're going to look at a couple of examples of problems that fit this framework, but there are many more. Now the goal is to choose these filter coefficients that we put in the vector w to minimize the mean squared error between d and d hat. So I'm going to put this vector w to contain those coefficients or filter weights. And then if we look at the definition of what mean squared error that we want to minimize, in other words, the minimum mean squared error, we can write that as the minimum over the filter coefficients, in other words, we're trying to find W, to minimize the mean value of the squared error. So the mean here is the expected value, which is the way we define mean in our probability. And what this really means is that we are trying to find the w that makes e squared of n as small as possible on average. Now in practice, we don't have uh, probability distributions and statistics for our data. So we what we have is our data itself. And so we're going to approximate this mean squared error with a sum. And so we're going to take some section of data that's capital L samples long, say from time n equals little l1 to l1 plus capital L minus 1, and we're going to try to find w that minimizes the average squared interval over those capital L time samples. So let's look at a couple applications of this idea. And then in later lectures, we'll look at how to choose w to solve these minimum mean squared error problems. So the first application that I want to look at is a noise suppression application. And in this case, we're assuming that D of N contains some signal that we're interested in, which I've denoted as S of N, and some noise or interference, which we're calling V of N. We're going to assume that we have access to some X of N, which is a version of the noise and interference that may not be exactly the same as the one that's contaminating the signal, but it's closely related to it. So the idea is to take this related version of the interference, filter it appropriately, 
to try and estimate the interference and then we subtract that out and if we do a good job the error that we get out here is just the signal that we're interested in s of n so this process has suppressed this noise now the trick in a particular application is getting access to some version of the interference signal without the signal of interest being present. It's important that the signal S of n and X of n be uncorrelated or unrelated. If they are related, then it's possible to choose W to get rid of some of S of n as well, and we don't want that to happen. So here's one scenario in which a noise suppression application would be applied. And that is a case where we have, say, two microphones. One of the microphones is pointed at a speaker that we're interested in listening. So this signal coming from the desired speaker here is S of N. And there's some noise in the background that's coming from some other direction and arriving at the microphone. So the sum of these the desired speaker and the interference results in our signal D of N. Now since we know where the desired speaker is located, we can introduce a second microphone whose gain is zero in the direction of the desired signal. The desired signal doesn't show up in the output of this microphone, but the interference, which comes from other, some other direction, does show up. And because this microphone has a different gain pattern than the first microphone and is located in a different position, the interference that we observe here is not identical to the interference that was observed there. And by filtering X of N appropriately, we can estimate the interference that was contaminating microphone 1 and subtract it out to get an estimate of our desired signal. You can do very similar things with antennas or basically any sensor, provided you have the ability to remove the desired signal from one of the reference channels. There's another example that fits this general framework, and that is system modeling or estimation of systems. So the problem here is that we have some unknown system we have an input going into that system, an output coming out of that system, and we'd like to have a model or a mathematical description for the behavior of this particular system. The system could be a communication channel, say the uh, DSL modem channel from the, your provider to your house, or it could be a physical space or a physical device. For example, it could represent the effect of speaking into a microphone and then being transmitted through speakers to a particular seat or location in an auditorium. Now in this problem, we can take the input and call that X of N. That's our input to our filter. And then the output of our filter is compared to the desired signal out here, and we want to minimize this error. So if we do a good job of minimizing this error, then W is mimicking the unknown system because it's taking the same input and producing essentially the same output. For this approach to work, we're assuming that the unknown system is linear, and we also have to have access to the input and the output of this particular system. And then finally, a little bit more subtly, in order to get a complete model of the system, we require that the input contains all frequencies of interest. In other words, that it's a efficiently rich or broadband input signal. If you put in a single sinusoid here, then the only thing we're going to model is the behavior of the unknown system at that frequency. So the third example that I want to consider in this lecture is that of equalization. Now in equalization, we have a signal of interest that's going through some sort of distortion. Perhaps it's due to an imperfect sensor. It could be something like a camera, motion blur, room acoustics, and so on. And then we have an output signal. And our goal is to take the output signal and recover the input signal. Now the way we would set this problem up is to take the output signal and have that be the input to our filter W. 
and then try to find filter coefficients so that the output of this filter gives us back the input, the original system. We have to incorporate a delay because this system certainly has some delay through it. This filter also is going to have some delay. And so we don't want to try to undo that delay with our filter, but rather predict in the middle. And that, that's something I don't want to get into right now. But if we can drive E of n to be very small, then W is recovering the input to our distortion from the output and it's equalizing or undoing the effect of the distortion on the input signal. Now one thing if you think about this for a minute, you say, but wait a minute, if I wanted the input signal and you're telling me that I need the input signal to come up with W, then what's the point? Well, the point is that oftentimes we can use a training signal or a limited time interval where we know what the input is, and we measure the output, we design W, and then that known input goes away and is replaced by some arbitrary input, and our W that we learned then will be able to recover the unknown input. This setup typically is used in the context of having ability to put in training signals. And as I mentioned, the delay is needed to account for the net time shift introduced by both the distortion and W. As in the previous problem, you need a sufficiently rich input here so that you can recover the distortion over a wide frequency band. And finally, you can't equalize zero. So if this distortion zeroes out certain frequencies, we're never going to be able to recover those with our filter. So in summary, we're looking at a general problem of the form where we have a signal D of n and another signal X of n. We're going to pass X of n through a, an FIR filter and design our filter coefficients so that the output of the filter approximates D of n as close as possible. So that means we're going to try to find W to minimize the mean squared error or in a approximate sense using data that we can actually measure we're going to minimize the average over some interval. This formulation applies to a lot of signal processing problems. I illustrated it for three problems here. There's quite a few more. So we looked at interference suppression, system identification, and equalization. You can also interpret things like linear prediction, beam forming for antenna arrays, and a whole host of other problems in this general construct. And so it's a powerful framework that's well worth learning about.